Hi and welcome back to another video of Medic Notes. This video will be on Cerebral Palsy. Cerebral Palsy is a disorder of movement and posture due to a non-progressive lesion of the motor pathway in the developing brain, which develops when the child is less than 2 years old. The epidemiology, the most common cause of motor impairment in children is Cerebral Palsy and the incidence is around 2 cases per 1,000 cases of live births. These are the causes of cerebral palsy, can be divided into antenatal, intrapartum, and postpartum causes. So the most common etiology will be from the antenatal cause, which consists of 80% of the cases. The antenatal causes include cerebral dysgenesis, failure of migration of gray matter, congenital malformation, such as congenital cysts or fusion defect, congenital infections like tortuous infection, vascular occlusion due to eruption of placenta or placenta previa, and other antenatal causes such as GDM, which is gestational diabetes mellitus, and PIH, which is, which is pregnancy-induced hypertension in the mother when she was pregnant. For intrapartum causes, it consists of 10% out of the cases, and the causes are birth asphyxia, also called as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which can be due to respiratory distress, cord prolapse or strangulation, or meconium aspiration. Other causes include trauma causes such as due to instrumental delivery, like forceps or vacuum. Whereas postpartum causes also consist of 10% out of all the cases, and the causes include preterm infant, which could be associated with periventricular leukomalacia, which is the ischemic necrosis of the periventricular white matter, intraventricular hemorrhage, cerebral anoxia or ischemia, or CNS infections such as meningitis or encephalitis, trauma to the head, symptomatic hypoglycemia, hydrocephalus, or even hyperbilirubinia, hyperbilirubinemia, which causes connectors in the baby. So these are the possible causes of cerebral palsy. The symptoms of the patient having cerebral palsy, they may have feeding difficulties due to the pseudobulbar palsy, and the difficulties include oral motor discoordination, slow feeding, and they might also have gagging and vomiting episodes. Developmental delay in language and social skills is also one of the clinical features. The signs that we can look out for are delayed in the motor milestones, abnormal light limb tone and posturing, abnormal gait, which is often the hemiplegic gait. Once they start walking, we can notice this. For those infants who are less than 12 months old, one of the signs would be a hand preference, which could suggest for hemiparsis in cerebral palsy. Also, they might present with persistent primitive reflex, where the primitive reflexes persist after 6 months old. Usually, they are gone by 6 months. However, if they persist, it could be a sign of cerebral palsy. There are four types. There are a few types of cerebral palsy that can be classified based on four features. So it can be classified based on motor function, topographical distribution, the severity level of the cerebral palsy, and a classification system which is the GMFCS, Gross Motor Function Classification System. So first we look at the motor function. Can be four types, which are spastic type, ataxic, dyskinetic, or mixed type of cerebral palsy. And the most common one would be the spastic cerebral palsy. So take a look at this table. There are the four types of cerebral palsy classified based on the motor function. So first, the spastic type consists of 70% out of all the cases. And the spastic type is due to a damage to the upper motor neuron pathway. The clinical features include hypertonia, where the patient may have fisting of the hand, cast knife spasticity, can be noted as well. The Babinski reflex will be upgoing, and there may be scissoring of the legs, equinal virus, or, and also windswept hip deformities, which are the classic signs that can be seen in spastic cerebral palsy. So there are a few forms of spastic cerebral palsy where they are consist of hemiplegia, diplegia, and quadriplegia. 
So this one is about the topographical distribution, which I will explain more later on. Regarding the scissoring of the legs, it is when the infant is, has grown up. There is spasticity of the extensor or adductor muscles of the lower limb, causing scissoring of the legs. Equinovirus is a deformity of the foot, where the foot is in dorsiflexion and inversion. Whereas the windswept hip deformity is an ipsilateral internal rotation and adduction of the hip joint, with external rotation and abduction of the contralateral hip joint. So moving on to the second type, which is the ataxic cerebral palsy. This type of cerebral palsy affects the coordination, balance, and posture, and the most common cause is due to genetic cause. It can also be due to cerebellar dysfunction. So the clinical features are hypotonia, compared to just now the spastic type is hypertonia. So in ataxic type, it is hypotonia, and there is impact in balance, and also uncoordinated and involuntary movements. They also have impact control of eye movement and depth perception and fine motor skills requiring the coordination of eyes and hands, for example writing, will be difficult for them. So they are more towards impairment of the coordinated movements, balance and their posture. The third type is the dyskinetic type, where it is caused by perinatal cause due to connectors which is the most common cause, and this connectors causing damage to the basal ganglia or the extrapyramidal pathway. It can also be due to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy at term, and the clinical features include constant involuntary movements, such as atetosis, which is repetitive, involuntary, slow riffing movements at the arms, legs, or hands. Dystonia is the impairment of the muscular tone. Chorea is irregular movement and more like jerky on shaky movement, whereas choreoatetoid is the combination of chorea and atetosis, where there is irregular movement but the movement is twisting and curving. So these are some of the involuntary movements that can be seen in this kinetic type of cerebral palsy, and usually their intellectual ability is unimpaired. And the fourth type would be the mixed type, which is a combination of different types and the most common combination will be the spastic type plus atetoid type. So looking at the second way to classify cerebral palsy, which is based on the topographical distribution. So these are the few types. Hemiplegia is paralysis on one side of the body, and usually the cause is due to perinatal stroke or cerebral malformation. Diplegia is when it affects both the legs or affects both the arms and the common cause is due to preterm delivery of the baby and usually the legs are affected more compared to the arms quadriplegia is when the paralysis involves all four limbs and the causes could be hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and there are also other types such as monoplegia affecting only one limb paraplegia affecting the lower half of the body, triplegia involving three limbs, and also pentaplegia, where it affects all the four limbs plus the paralysis of the neck and the head. And this type is often accompanied by eating and also breathing complications. The third way to classify cerebral palsy is based on the severity level. So it can be mild, moderate, or severe. For mild severity, the child can move without any resistance and their daily activities are not affected. For moderate severity, the child will need braces, medications, and adaptive technology to complete their daily activities. And if it is severe, they will require wheelchair and have significant challenges in accomplishing daily activities. The fourth way to classify is based on the Gross Motor Function Classification System, GMFCS. So there are five levels of classification. Level one is the child is able to walk indoors and outdoors and also climb stairs without any limitations. Level two, they walk with limitations, such as cannot walk for a long distance or they may need mobility device. Or shown in this picture here, when they are climbing stairs, they need to hold onto the railing. For level three, 
they will need to work with an adaptive assistance. They require handheld mobility device assistance. Indoors and outdoors, they use wheelchair. For level 4, they need a powered mobility assistance. So you can see the wheelchair is the powered type of wheelchair. Level 5, there is severe head and trunk control limitations. So they require an extensive use of assisted technology device. And you see this picture over here, the child will need someone to help push the wheelchair. So that's on the four ways to classify cerebral palsy. To investigate, we can do imaging studies such as MRI of the brain. It can help to evaluate brain damage and also to determine those who are at risk for cerebral palsy. But it does not help in the definitive diagnosis of cerebral palsy. EEG is useful in evaluating the seizure condition and other investigation we can do is hearing and vision screening for the child. For management of cerebral palsy, the main aim is to increase the quality of life, inform the par parents about the details of the diagnosis as soon as possible, and it requires a multidisciplinary team approach involving the doctor, the parent, and also the community. For medical treatment, the medications that we can give are muscle relaxant, such as dazepam, baclofen, or dentroline sodium. For orthopedic, can help to correct the deformities and neurosurgery to reduce spasticity or disabling dystonic movements. So it involves a few departments and also psychiatry for psychological and social problems, education, rehabilitation, such as physiotherapy to maintain the full range of movement, functions and also to prevent contractures in the child. Speech therapy helps them to control their drooling as well. External aid such as design shoes, ankle foot orthosis may be required to provide stability to the joints in the child who is learning to stand and walk. And also other external aid include wheelchair and splinter. So the prognosis of cerebral palsy, so far there is no curative treatment and the main aim is to increase the quality of life. And the prognosis is based on the pattern of the evolving signs and the child's developmental progress. That's all for this video. Thank you.